Hello, and welcome to the Insert Movie Reference Here podcast. I am one of your hosts, Mr. Nick Casino. And I am not the host, but I am the other part of the podcast with talking, Joe Kniff. Joe, we've talked about this. You're the co-host. <laughs> no, I refuse. Joe, it's a dual podcast. It's not It's not like Sinister Dreamcast where I have to, like, round up a bunch of people and, like, force the conversation. And I don't have... It's not like Sinister Dreamcast where I have to tell Justin to shut up. Right. So, <laughs> that is kind of the good thing about this podcast. We don't have anyone to, to shit on and tell to shut up. It does help the flow of the podcast a lot of times. Yeah. I love Sinister Dreamcast and I love doing it, but a lot of times I'll listen to it and I'm just rolling my eyes like, uh, I should have told him to shut up earlier. Well, that's why court jesters were adopted, you know? It's, you gotta have somebody there to, you know, just kind of... You know, just that everyone can kind of bag on. But they're still there for, like, comic relief. And if they don't do their job for comic relief, you know, there's, like, that self-deprecation that they can they can absorb from everybody. It's really amazing. Justin just has that in his life. For those of you who don't listen to Sinister Dreamcast, we're talking about Justin Papalardo. Every single guest... Who I had guest... the honor of, of meeting this past year. Yeah, JoJo, actually. Joe got to put a face to the, the stories. Um... But every single guest that has come on Sinister Dreamcast picks up on that immediately. We don't tell them that, like, Justin's the one we, like, make fun of or anything. Every single one of them, if, even if they don't listen to the podcast for, like, research. Like, Dave Sermonera picked up on it immediately and started making fun of Justin. Like, I don't know what it is about him. I guess he just has, like, not that he does, but the best way to explain it is he has a very punchable face, like a verbally punchable face. Mm -hmm. So people just kind of like, oh, I'm supposed to make fun of this guy. Okay, I get it. Um, yeah, when we when you did the live recording at the Meadery and I was there and I uh, I posed a question, I felt the need to single him out. I could mm -hmm. have posed any general question, but I just felt the need. I was just compelled to single him out on the question and corner him and uh, and... Make him come up with something that I knew that he was not qualified to come up with. <laughs> it's like that, I don't reference it a lot, but it's like that episode of Family Guy where Chris becomes a ball shagger. And, like, the uh, uh, customers just completely expand because people have this need to hit Chris with ball, uh, golf balls. That's Justin. Yeah. Justin's our Chris Griffin. But... We're not talking about Justin on this podcast, uh, or at least anymore. This week, we're going to be doing a franchise spotlight to one of the most revolutionary franchises and maybe the history of cinema that just goes from the heights to just, what the fuck are you doing? I don't know if there's another movie franchise and i know a lot of them like i know when it comes to sequels a lot of movies take a hit in terms of quality but this one just full-on just became a franchise after the first one and i don't think there's another one that you can point to that just it's almost like you want to you you just I, you wish it didn't become a franchise you wish it would just stay yeah. a standalone movie is is there only that's the only way you can kind of which is weird because it's set up for like a franchise, like at the end of the movie. We're talking about yeah. The Matrix, everybody. We're talking about The Matrix trilogy. At the end of the movie, you wanted to see it, but after seeing it, you're like, what the fuck? Yeah. Um, it just, just it's, it is one of those story roll of the dice things, isn't it? It's like, this movie at the end could have gone in a million different directions, and they rolled the dice, and they went in a direction that most people kind of just didn't want it to go. Like, they... Yeah. The cyber world aspect is really, I think, what intrigued people about the first one, and they really, really just kept getting further and further away from that. And yeah. that, I think the problem was is that there was, and I don't know, Nick, do you subscribe to this? I think the problem was is that they treated the Matrix solely, entirely, like as if it was the the antagonist. 
I could see that. The it entire like... Matrix as being in the antagonist. And and I feel like they should have gone the opposite. Like, the Matrix was initially intended, and its intentions and its sole purpose was actually to be for something good. And it went awry, and that's what Neo's purpose was, is to bring it back to what it was meant, meant to be. I could see that. That seems like a very Wachowski's thing to do. Just a heads up right now. Um, we may say Wachowski brothers every once in a while. We apologize. We know that they're both women now. Um, I don't. I only know Lana. I don't know uh, formerly Larry's new name. Um, so we're just going to try to refer to them universally as the Wachowskis. Uh, apologies if we slip. Um, just out of habit. Uh, but we have nothing but respect for their decisions to uh, to be their true gender. Yeah, I'll um, probably just say the Wachowskis, and then I'll, pro- I'll probably say Wachowski sometimes, or I'll just mispronounce things, so you'll just understand that I'm an idiot anyhow. <laughs> yeah, but I just want to put that at the, the forefront just in case we slip, because The Matrix is like, it's one of those movies that Joe and I share. It's, uh, it's an important franchise in our friendship, but it isn't at the same time, so we may slip into old habits. I just want to put that at the beginning. But- also, to be to, to, in in defense of all of this, the Matrix, the original Matrix movie that that Nick and I will spend most of this podcast uh, talking about with positivity was directed by the Ma- was directed by the Wachowski brothers. Yeah, as it it says it in the credits. So just saying, it originally was it was directed by the Wachowski. They were brothers at the time, so. Um, yeah, I don't think they're changing... I think they're sticking with the Wachowskis. I don't think they're going to the Wachowski sisters. Okay. Also, I don't know if the DGA would let them change it again, to be honest with you. I have I no like, idea. I, I, I feel like the DGA has, like, a one-time change-your-name rule. Yeah. Like, that seems like something the DGA would do. Yeah. Um, but... Um, so, Joe, I'm gonna let you take this beginning because... You were the one who introduced me to the Matrix. I remember very vividly. Me too, actually. This is a this is a memory that I have too, very strongly. That you came over my house to hang out on a Friday night, and you had this this shiny VHS case in your hand, going like, "Dude, we need to watch this movie." And I'm like, "Okay, it has Keanu Reeves in it, fine." And we popped the VHS into my VCR, and we started watching it. And I will always remember, the second that Neo is woke out of the Matrix, you pause the movie and you go, do you understand what's going on here? <laughs> and, you, and you proceeded to explain everything to me. And I'm like, okay. And I, we finished watching it and I, 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 got, I, I would say I understood it like 95% the first watching. And then after I watched it again, I got it from there. But So Joe, where did you find this find the matrix um so i um i have family that lives in georgia and uh we rarely would go visit them but for the first time um in many years i got a chance to go visit them now they come up to pittsburgh all the time to visit but this is the first time in a very long time i got to go to georgia um and visit them so my uh uncle rich who you know nick uh who oh, i yes. uh, he, he's he's quite a character uh everything goes back to vietnam for him he's very much like you know you'll be just talk it's 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 one of the reasons I adore um, Walter in um, The Big Lebowski so much is because here's this because there's that that line you know not everything has to do not, what the hell has to do with Vietnam like that was pretty much what life growing up with my uncle Rich was like because there'd what be if, a conversation about the weather that would turn into Vietnam somehow. Um, well, one of my favorite <laughs> memories of your uncle Rich is going to a Steeler game. It was the first time he's been to a Steeler game since the newly constructed Heinz Field. <laughs> yeah, what a, what a what a what a collection of people, by the way, to go to a Steeler game. <laughs> and it was me, it was you, Jeter, me, your dad, and your uncle Rich, and we're in. And I remember being in the back seat with you and your uncle Rich, and we drive by the stadium, and there's this big sign that says Heinz Field with the Heinz logo as Field, and he's like, "Man, they got to get rid of that sign. It's tacky." <laughs> That's a tacky sign. <laughs> and then I think you and I even corrected him, like, well, they paid a lot of money to put that sign up there to get the naming rights. And he's like, yeah, but they should still take that sign down. It's tacky. It's tacky. And then <laughs> like, I feel like we we dropped it for, like, a good minute, and he's just like, 
Yeah, that sign's tacky. <laughs> yeah. And it's and the reason we even talk about this is because this is just he was just a little bit out of touch and he wasn't entirely aware of the modern world. You know what I mean? Like and how the world functions currently, you know? Yeah. And, and and fortunately, as many people from his generation that went to Vietnam, they are very much stuck in the past because they saw things and it was all for nothing. And they're just trying to justify their past all the time and the things that they did um, because it really is a war that meant nothing. And it's a, probably a terribly hollow feeling. Yeah. So uh, many Vietnam vets have trouble keeping up with, with um, um, the current condition of society. So um, one of those things is maybe taking your, uh, you know, how old was I at the time? 13? Thir- yeah, 13 or 14. 13 or 14, age. you know, like taking taking your 14 and 15 year and 16 year old nephew to the blockbuster to run a movie and not actually considering what the rating of the movie is. Because he also, another important thing is he doesn't have kids and he never did. So uh, it, there's, he's never been in an experience where he's taking kids to a blockbuster before. So that's never even something that crossed his mind. So um, the movie had just come out pretty recently on on VHS, and because um, we should note, the Matrix bombed in theaters. Absolutely, bombed. yeah, it didn't do well. I think it made its money back, but it didn't. You know, it yeah. didn't have critical acclaim. There wasn't a large fan reaction. No to one it. got and, it. Yeah, yeah, it just it went over your head, and and I think, and it was um, it, it, was that around Columbine or something. 1999, so yes. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, so there are trench coats and everything and people with guns, and it was just something that people just didn't want to draw attention to. Anyhow, we walk into the the blockbuster, there's a cardboard cutout of Keanu Reeves' as Neo, and they have the thing out, and, you know, they're just playing new release with, like, the, uh, what was, what I remember being the 90s uh, gimmicky thing, you know what I mean? Like, 90s gimmick was the best. It was always over the top. It was it involved cardboard cutouts. It involved, you know, like putting a character in, in a real life form in front of you somehow. Uh, you know, if it were a Batman movie, a man would literally be at the blockbuster dressed as Batman. <laughs> like, I remember that type of stuff. Um, so there it is. And, and my uncle, and I'm excited about it. Our uncle is excited about it. He's like, yeah, let's watch. He wants to see it. We want to see it. It just caught our eye. Three males at a blockbuster the matrix came out we all bought into the 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 marketing the the gimmick marketing so we get that and uh i'm sitting in the car on the way back and i'm reading the thing and i see it and i and i for the and folks this is the first r movie i ever saw in in its full form i had probably seen r movies on television or something like that um or maybe you know somebody had one in when i was in the room and i never watched that entire movie and I definitely never saw an R movie in theaters at this point. This was the first R movie that I was about to see in its entirety. And I knew my mother was not going to be happy about it when we brought it back. <laughs> yes, so, I understand, everyone. Joe's mother is very traditional Italian Catholic. Yes, so we get back and she's like, what movie did you get? And I'm grinning. <laughs> she's like, what are you smiling about? She sees the movie and she's not happy that it's R. Somehow, I don't remember. I think it's because of my uncle's influence that he actually wants to see this movie. We watch the movie. I don't understand it one bit. I don't understand a second of what I'm watching, but it is cool as hell. And that was my first understanding of The Matrix. Not fully understanding at all what I was watching and knowing that it was cool as hell. That week that we were in Georgia, we watched like another two times before we brought it back. And then when we got home, I don't know how I got my hands on the one that I was that I showed you, Nick. I don't know if we went out and bought it or if I had just rented it again. I have no idea if the one that you watched was a rental or one that I had purchased. I remember the it was, quality. It was, it was definitely one that you purchased because I vividly remember the VHS sleeve. Oh, okay. Okay, so then it would, you would remember something like that, like a trinket yes. about it like that. So, um, so yeah, so, so I guess I went home, rushed home, and bought the damn thing. Or who knows, maybe I bought it right there at Blockbuster that, that week. And, um, but at that, by the time I had showed you, Nick, I had probably watched it about four or five times. <laughs> and, and I thought I had, it, to some extent, that my 13-year-old brain could wrap my head around what was going on. Now, now in hindsight, it seems silly that even just the the 
sort of uh, virtual reality world that was the Matrix was something that was really hard for me to grasp. In hindsight, it was very difficult for me to grasp that there were two different worlds going on parallel. Um, it was just mind-boggling at the time. And, at, at, and I remember thinking that they didn't do a good job of conveying this movie because I had to rewatch it to understand it. But what I didn't understand was actually they did an incredible job with this movie and that if you didn't understand it as a viewer, that was your problem. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And it was the first time ever I'd really watched a movie that wasn't laid out to me in, in that way. 90s movies were very three-act structure. There was very little twists in movies. There was, uh, you know, 90s movies were very simple, easy to follow. Um, they, they didn't throw you for a loop. They didn't try to confuse you too much. You know, a lot of these movies were not that crazy. So a movie like this was something that I had really never, ever, ever seen before. And, um, you know, movies like this really paved the way for, like, you know, Fight Club and shit like that, you know? But, I mean, the influence of this movie is profound. Um, and not just from a story aspect either, technologically too. But yeah, so I rush over and show you this movie and I, jeez, I was just beside my, this is the, I thought I was, and you know that joy when you found something great and you get to share it with somebody that you also yeah. know will share it? That was, to me, like, The Matrix was the first movie that you and I really did this with. That it was like, dude, you, you're going to love this. I love it. But I want you – but I really – I didn't want you to see it for the first time and look at me and go, what the fuck was that? Like that's what I was terrified of is that like you were going to feel the exact same way I did the first time about the story that I did. No matter what, you were going to think it was cool. I knew that. But I wanted you to understand it. And I wanted you to be up to speed with me on it because I wanted to talk about it with you. Yeah. So th- you could say that The Matrix has a lot to do with this very podcast here. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually true. Now that you're saying it, it's like The Matrix should have been one of our first episodes. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's hard to, you know, look back on history and really dial all this stuff back, which is why we're 140-some episodes in now almost. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and we're just there. now going, you know, The Matrix is probably the biggest influence of us talking about movies. But it is. It was the first link of, like, it was the first movie I ever introduced anyone to, too, as well. I never really took a movie and said, here, watch this. That's, that never happened before The Matrix and, and me showing it to you. Mm-hmm. Every movie you watched, you watched it with everybody else. You saw The Lion King with everybody. Like, you didn't consider yeah. going, hey, you know what movie, great movie you should watch is? The Lion King. Like, you never thought of suggesting that movie to anybody. Because every, every movie you and I watched was a phenomenon at the time. You know, like Jurassic Park, and these movies are phenomenon. No one was, no one was like, secretly telling you to see something, you know? It, it was the, the whole world was telling you to see it, and you're like, all right, I'll get to it, you know? Yeah, I mean, I brought up The Matrix on I, all three Matrix on the IMDb just for reference. And on IMDb, they'll give you uh, related movies. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is The Matrix. It's all three Lord of the Rings movies, Forrest Gump, Inception, and Gladiator. Like, those are all the related movies. And every single one of those did amazing in the box office. Uh, and most, a good bit of all, of all of them except Inception are Oscar-nominated. So... Um, One of the things I do want to talk about, like, briefly, is um, the major influence on uh, The Matrix, which is anime. And how uh, Japanese anime, or anime, as uh, the douchebags would like to correct you, (laughs) just like it's not manga, it's manga, um, the, the, the really strong influence in the structure and the style of the Matrix that the Wachowskis took from anime. Um, obviously, I shouldn't say obviously, Joe and I don't really watch that much anime. I can count on my hand how many animes I've watched, so we can't talk about it too in-depth, but it's something that I want to bring up because it's... I think it is the Matrix is a big reason why, um, like, teenagers right now, anime is a big fucking deal to teenagers right now. Like, that's a lot of what teenagers are into at the moment. And The Matrix, I feel like, you could you could draw a direct line from The Matrix to the rise of anime right now. Yeah, that's a fair... I mean, yeah, there's... I mean, it... This movie was... I mean, you know, Animatrix, obviously, which came out in between. And, um, you know, it's interesting. When you look at the Animatrix, you, you, you immediately see how using anime as not just an influence, um, but also as a way to grow the audience. Um, yeah. Realizing that, hey, there's, there's 
sort of like the, the the filmmakers going, you know, there was an inspiration here that I don't know if a lot of people caught on that's going to easily, easily transfer into anime. And if we, you know, and if you do that, it'll, you can turn out more content with it. What's amazing about The Matrix is that since The Animatrix, there's, you, you'd think that right now there would be some sort of Matrix TV show going on. Yeah, it's actually really amazing that there isn't. Yeah, remarkable, actually. As much as people want to shit on the other two movies, there's still a world, though, that was built in that you could play around with. The world's fine. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with the world. Um, But one of the things that's also really interesting about The Matrix is, like we said, it didn't do super in the box office. Um, Let me look real quick. Yeah, the opening, it was a $63 million movie. Mm -hmm. Um and it uh, it made most of its money overseas because the opening weekend was a twenty seven million dollar movie. So it was one of those things that I'm sure the the execs at Warner Brothers went, "Well, that's a failure." And this movie made a lot of its money on home video, which I think it's one of the first. Don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure it's one of the first movies to be sequels to be greenlit based solely on home video sales. Yeah, 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 that was a big jump. I mean, it did okay, like, it didn't flop in the in the theater. It did okay, but yeah, like, the way, and I don't know why that was, like, I, I want to say, like, and I'm looking at the release date was March 31st of 99, why it would, this movie would come out in March, you know what I mean? Like, that was another thing, that was a dead area, for, that was back in the day, Nick, whenever, that was, that was a dead zone for movies. Yeah. Movies just didn't do that well then, you know? So for and I think this movie probably came out on DVD in the summer. I would guess that I went probably yeah I probably went to Georgia in the summertime yeah. on summer vacation. So yeah, I we it came out in the summer. There's not much to do. Summer movies are out. You can rent movies like it's all movies all the time. And this movie just did well in terms of sales after that, and it just picked up more and more. And a lot of that also at the time, Nick, if you remember. Uh, Get, for us in our generation, you you and I remember going to an R movie as being like getting into a bar. Yeah, it was like heavily, heavily difficult for us to get into um um R movie or uh you know what I mean like that. I remember them like asking for ID or anything like that or or you know what I mean? like I remember them turning away business at theaters because you weren't old enough. Um, we had to suffer through Battlefield Earth because they wouldn't let us into Gladiator. Yeah, we couldn't see Gladiator because of that, and I'll never f- fucking forgive them for it because that I feel like I like I feel like I missed a, po- a part of pop culture. Yeah, by not seeing that movie in theaters. Um, I remember like the Oscars that year and just being mad that I didn't get to see this movie. Yeah, and it's like winning awards, and I'm like, God damn it! Like everyone, if if a movie wins an Oscar for Best Picture, everyone should be able to see it. Yeah. But, um, so, I, yeah, at the time it was, like, extremely difficult for our generation. And, and it's interesting because we were the target audience, and I think that's what had a lot to do with it, is that young adolescent male were the target audience, and they couldn't actually see this movie in theaters. I think it also had a lot to do with um, the fact Warner Brothers didn't know how to sell it. Yeah, no, no clue. Zero clue. The marketing for this movie was... Probably terrible. I mean, I don't remember trailers for it, but I'm sure it was all... I mean, how do you sell this movie? That's probably still a question that would be asked if this movie came out today. Yeah, uh, Will Smith was originally supposed to play Neo. Mm -hmm. And he, uh... He's gotten kind of, like... I don't want to say shitty, but kind of like, come on, like... How are you supposed to explain this movie to anyone, you know? Yeah, I mean... It, it it is that is a difficult aspect of it, and I'm sure a lot of I th- I'm sure one of the problems that they had was somebody like Will Smith read the script and was like not really fully getting it, just like the rest of us aren't weren't really fully getting it the first time they watched it. Um, Which you have to like people shit on Keanu Reeves a lot about him being an idiot, but the fact that he was on board for this movie, yeah, kind of says a lot about him and his taste. Also, this started up another thing about um, fandom. Um, nerd fandom and it appealed to um, a large group of nerds because um, something that nerds pride themselves on heavily is that the content of what they love the everyday person that dislikes it 
just, and I quote this, doesn't get it. Yeah. And boy, the Matrix was just ripe with opportunity to look down on people that didn't like this thing. We did it. I remember yeah. that specifically. Yeah, absolutely. If you didn't like this movie, it's because you just weren't smart enough to understand it. And that is the fucking terrible, terrible mentality of the fans of The Matrix developed. Which made it even harder when the next two movies came out and uh, and, and really hurt really hurt that fan base. And, and now it's one of the reasons that... Because that's the I think that's one of the major problems with... Reloaded and specifically Revolutions is that that fan base didn't really have a way of they turned on their own product basically. Mm-hmm. Basically, you let that entire fan base turn on the Matrix because now it was like as if the the very creators didn't get it, <laughs> and it kind of felt that way. I think with the sequels is it's like the very creators don't even understand it. And they not only did they not understand it entirely, they didn't understand why what was beloved about it. Yeah, and I agree with that. and and I and I think they missed they missed the mark on what what was likable about what they had made, and and then the, all of that fan, that 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 stuck up fan base that went you know you just don't get it then turned to the very creators of this and went you just don't get it and and that just I think deflated the whole thing. And when you look at the critical reviews, it just Reloaded takes a hit, but then Revolutions just it just takes a nosedive to the point where actually that movie did not do well at all um, in the box office. It actually did worse than the first movie. I believe that Reloaded set the table for a a flop. Yeah, it did. Um, but going back to the Matrix, mm-hmm. I just I just remember. It being one of those, you just you felt so smart watching mm-hmm. it. You know what I mean? Like it was, it was one of those. And like I know that's like me saying out loud, it sounds shitty, but we were thirteen and fourteen, so cut us a break. <laughs> um, but it was like it was the first time where I think it was the first time that we saw something revolutionary. You know what I mean? Like people have talked about like with like Psycho. How mm-hmm. Psycho was, like, such a big deal because, like, Janet Lee dies and, like, by the end of the first act and all this kind of stuff. Like, you know what I mean? Like, and there's, um, we were talking about that on Sinister Dreamcast with American uh, Werewolf in London. Like, the effect of that movie, the, the, some of the effect on that movie's lost because we're, you know, 20 plus years removed from, uh, for, uh, or 30 plus years removed from it. And, like, The Matrix was kind of ours, in that way, that we saw something that was revolutionary, not only in visual effects, but also in storytelling. Yeah, I think in uh, visual aspects... <laughs> I, think, I think in a visual effects um, standpoint, it's the it's our generation Star Wars. Yeah. Um, from just visual uh, effects, obviously. Um, <laughs> it's our generation Star Wars and seeing a movie where the things that were happening on the screen... You watched it and you went, how did they do that? And it's something that I really, really miss from uh, movies today is people just don't ask that question anymore. And it's something about movie magic that is really starting to become lost is because computers do everything and every child that watches a movie knows that computers do everything. So they don't wonder how it's done. They know that it's done because a computer did it. Because they ask their parents, they go, how did they do that? And the parents don't say, I don't know. Because they don't know. But instead of saying, I don't know, parents say, well, they do with computers. Yeah. And that's so fucking deflating, I imagine, for young, aspiring children that are in awe of movies. And the visual yeah. aspect of movies is there's no wonder anymore in movies. You know, it's, it's a complete... And I, I, would, I really do wonder how kids... How a child today looks through the eyes into movies. Because they're not... They don't question it. And they don't... They never want – like, I, I remember watching movies as a kid and just wondering how they did things, you know? Yeah. When you're just in that, like, discovery phase and you just want to know how things work and what is that and what – and you see movies and that was another thing that you were like, how did they do this? Whoa, how, what? That's like magic. And it was like you were seeing a magic trick on screen. It doesn't exist anymore. Like, it's – computers did it. And I remember watching The Matrix and seeing that bullet time and just 
just shaking my head, just not understanding how this was created. Yeah. And then even seeing the behind the scenes of it and still just being amazed, like, that they created this thing. Like, it was amazing. It was amazing innovation. Yeah. And, I mean, also to be said, this movie worked on a... For an R-rated movie, it worked on a lot of levels. This is one of the few movies I showed to my father and he fucking liked. My father's quite the curmudgeon when it comes to movies. <laughs> um, and he... The, it was a movie that him and I could watch together. Um, like, that that was the effect of this movie. Like, I remember just being kind of like Wildfire, where it was like... It was the worst kept secret. Yeah. Sort of thing. That's exactly the best way to put it. It's like, it was... The media, the soccer mom media was trying to shame it for the Columbine thing and the violence and all that stuff. But then there was that that sort of like the, that other side of that underground what was actually happening in the actual reaction. And this thing was – it felt like it, it felt like it was being introduced to people exactly the way I introduced it to you. It felt like everyone yeah. – it was just catching on. And it was like, oh, have you seen The Matrix yet? And people were like, what the fuck is The Matrix? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. And when someone said, what is it? The reaction wasn't, how have you not seen it yet? It was, let me show oh. you. Like, yeah, yeah. It, that, was, that was the reaction. It wasn't – it wasn't like today where it seems like, or at any time, like something is popular. Like, I feel like nowadays, like, you know, someone's like, did you see Game of Thrones? And I'm like, I don't watch Game of Thrones. And they're like, how have you not seen Game of Thrones? Like, no, one, like they just lash out at you. Like, I'm like, I just, I don't. Like, instead of going, let me show you this, you know? And that's what The Matrix was. It was this thing where it was like, learn this. I get to, I get to pass this on to somebody. Like, you get, you get to be the one that introduced someone to The Matrix, or you get to learn it from from anybody, from any. And it's just different. You experience it differently too. I think that way. You yeah. feel like you're discovering this little gem, even though it's being viewed all over the world. Yeah. So, we were all pumped about it. It was a huge influence on 1999 and 2000. To the point where it was parodied uh, at nauseum. Mm-hmm. Uh, another thing I also wanted to say. Um, Matrix was also viral before the internet. Like, the internet existed, but it wasn't in... It wasn't a major po- cultural force. Like uh, it is now. It went viral without the internet. Yeah, pretty Which much. Yeah, I mean, that's a, amazing. Yeah, it was a shared video that was literally shared. So we were all excited, we, we, you know, but we were like, oh, we're never going to see a sequel. Then Warner Brothers announced, hey, the home video sales were good enough. The Wachelsea's are going to be making a sequel. And we're like, fuck yeah, what's it called? Matrix Reloaded. Fuck yeah. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like amazing. Wait, it's not just going to be a sequel. It's going to be a two-part sequel. It's going to complete the trilogy in one year. And that's another thing people forget about these movies is that was that was revolutionary at the time. Oh, they yeah. and they now we see it all the time. We see you know part two and three of you know the Hunger Games both are coming out this year, and Harry Potter both parts are going to come out this year. And they basically make one giant movie and then they cut it up, which is what they did with this. But at the time, no one was getting they, that was insane. What the Wachowskis did with Reloaded and Revolutions was literally insane. They probably made the equivalent of four movies. Yeah. With the amount of work that they had to do. And with the amount of content and story paralleling that they decided to do. I don't know. <laughs> but anyways, uh, yeah. I mean, it, they, they ended up kind of making four movies in all of this when it was all said and done with, with the amount of workload that they put on themselves. Um, and then the Animatrix was going to come out in between. It came out in between Reloaded and Revolutions, right? Yes. I think, so it, yeah, it came out in the game. Yeah, yeah, they came out in between the movies. So you had like a year of all Matrix. It's insane. It was like 2002 or 4? No, it was 2003. Okay. Yeah, no, because um, Matrix Reloaded came out in the early spring, May. Came out in May, and then uh, Matrix Revolutions came out in November. Huh. Of the same year. And That's crazy. I, and so, I just remember. I remember Go us ahead. being so fucking excited. Oh, to the yeah. point that after the Reloaded happened, um, they had a preview for Revolutions. And they showed the only good parts in Revolutions, but we'll get Pretty there. Pretty much, yeah. Um, but what were your thoughts? I remember us both liking Reloaded 
quite a bit. Oh, yeah. So I equate Reloaded to, like, episode one. Like, yeah. you were just so fucking excited about this movie, and it was just, like, full of action and it had and the ghost twins. It, we could see it in theaters because we were both 17. Yes. That was another aspect of it. We could go and see it in theaters. And, yeah, we got to see it in theaters. We got to go, and it's, like, it looked insane. Like, the budget for that movie was ridiculous. Yeah, they, I mean, they they constructed a highway. Yeah, to do that highway scene. Yeah, they made a highway. That's insane. That's like a city planning project. They built a highway, like, out in the desert or something like that. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually looking up how much it was. Oh, yeah, it was $150 million, which was a huge budget. Yeah, huge. Early 2000s? Yeah, that's insane. Yeah. And they made their money back, but here's the problem. The movie has an incredibly unsatisfying ending. So the movie... Okay, this is what I will say about Matrix Reloaded. Is that it has a very solid first act and a very solid second act. And the majority of the third act is pretty solid. But then you meet the architect. That happens in Reloaded, right? Yeah? Yeah, that happens in Reloaded, yes. God. Which it's like, oh, do you have questions? Here's a pile more questions in the third act for you to go into the next movie. None of which will actually answer. Yes. Um, where you find out that the that Zion, the, the home city... And that was one of the things I was excited about Reloaded. We got to see Zion, the mm-hmm. last human city. We got to see the culture of the real world, not just the Matrix. We, even, we were even in the Matrix a little less... Mm-hmm. Um, which becomes a problem later. Um, uh, Neo f- understands his powers uh, better than he he did in the first one. He was he's fully formed. There's no origin story, if you will. Uh, so we can hit the ground running, and it's it's it was it was a thrill to watch. It really really was a thrill to watch. Like Neo truly un- trying to understand his powers, and like he him or should not try trying truly understanding his powers and unleashing those powers on the machines essentially it was it was thrilling to watch like we said that highway scene is is it's spellbinding do you feel like the visual effects slowly degrade as yes as re- like it just slow and then the revolutions it's almost not even up to par it's almost not they even pushed, good i think they pushed it too far yeah i think the wachowski's vision was not where they thought it was you know, kind of like with George Lucas with Episode One, where he's like, "Oh, oh, the technology's technology's met with my my vision." I'm like, "No, it hasn't, George. No, it hasn't. It it it's not aging well, George." And I think the Wachowskis do the same thing. A lot of a lot of Neo's flying effects, instead of just doing wire work, um, it was done completely CGI, and it doesn't look good. Yeah. So well, Reloaded well, is it was entertaining. I I feel like in hindsight, I look back and I'm like Reloaded was entertaining. Yeah, you get to the architect scene and it's just it's just a lot of thoughts? head shaking. What were your thoughts on it, Joe? Do you remember? the first time? Yes, I remember just being probably jazzed about it and just thrilled that I saw a Matrix movie. I thought it was just a lot of fun. You know, I it was do just about yeah. everything I expected. Although, yeah, that architect scene was always just like from the beginning. It was like, what is this? And just not the- following it. I do remember us driving back from the theater thinking that the architect scene was one of the most brilliant things we've ever saw because of how heady it was. Yeah. We were in, we were in that yeah. headspace where, like, oh, if we didn't understand it, then it's obviously good. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it went over our head, but we'll, like, just like the first one went over our head, we'll figure it out and we'll love it even more for it. And then I, I do remember rewatching and I'm going, like, oh, Wait, you're telling me all of this doesn't matter. That's what you're telling me. This all doesn't matter. Which was terribly disappointing. And I I, I feel like I realized that more after watching Revolutions. Because I've watched Reloaded more than once. I still own Reloaded. I'll, I'll pop it in every once in a while. I've only watched Revolutions once. And I have no interest in really watching it again. Um, I might pop it in at some point if I can, if I can track down a copy. But um, I'm not paying for it, I can tell you that much. Um, but I remember after watching Revolutions, 
the architect scene seems so deflating and so pointless and it's like why are we watching this then yeah like yeah it's it's like super existential to the but it's existential in a way that's like this guy knows that none of it matters yeah it's it's very eastern philosophy but unlike star wars it's not palatable to western yeah in the same way that we were going if you don't understand this you're an idiot the Wachowskis were going, if you don't understand this, you're an idiot. Mm-hmm. When it comes to, like, the whole Eastern... Like, a lot of the existential and esoteric parts of Matrix Reloaded Revolutions, you gotta do homework to truly understand. There's not a good explanation on the whole Eastern philosophy or any kind of, like, way of not necessarily dumbing it down, but giving the audience, a Western audience... A, through, a pathway to understanding it. I mean, say what you will about George Lucas, but he was very good at making the Eastern philosophy in the original Star Wars trilogy palatable to Western audiences and getting the audiences on board. That is something that the Wachowskis kind of failed at with Reloaded and Revolutions. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, trying to figure out... Wh- it's almost like they have the Matrix, right? And then they try to screw in their own philosophy around it. Instead of looking at the Matrix and actually... Like I said, it's like a roll of the dice with the story. Uh, they, they, you know, It could have gone so many different ways, the Matrix. Like, the way the first one ends, there's a million theories you could, you could bring up, you know, um, and, and carry out into a trilogy. And it just seems like they rolled the dice on on a couple of the of their own symbolic reasoning behind it, and it just never really fully molded itself to the to the first one. No, and I think it that felt they're too separate. Yeah, I think yeah that they're so different and they're so separate from the first one, and a lot of the charm of the first one that you you enjoy almost the cartoony aspect of the first one. Where it's like the, you, you can jump off a you know a building and it can the ground can turn into you know like a trampoline for a second yeah. like that sort of stuff was completely missing from the other two and, and just like that sort of bending reality stuff was was non-existent as well. It was more so like you were seeing a world where some people had special powers and another world where they definitely didn't. Yeah. And a war was waging betu- be- that were somehow connected between those two. And that's sort of the thing that was kind of crappy about the Reloaded and Revolutions is, like, the characters themselves sort of changed a little bit. And that how yeah. their ability to bend things was, uh, I don't know, not, ha- not handled the way it was, I feel, in the first one. There was no consistency in the universe rules, or as I like to say, the science of the movie. Yeah, yes. Um, another major problem I feel with, um, I mean, Revolutions is a problem from beginning to end. Uh, from the very beginning of that movie to the very end, it is just, just isn't working. It's like something isn't working, nothing's clicking, and, and then the, the, the final fight scene I feel like at the end is the, it's gotta be one of the biggest waste of times in, in any movie, ever. Ever. Like, all things considered... The plot, the characters, the story, the message of everything, where this is all going. That final fight scene is the biggest waste of time in the history of cinema. Yeah. I mean, it's just a huge waste of time. Within the story, it's a waste of time. Yeah. There's no point to it. No point. And they're just, they just keep punching each other. You're just like, where is this, like, what are they, at this point... That you have two characters that literally can't kill each other. That are, would be better off punching the ground in frustration. Yeah. Because they're just punching each other and no one's going to kill one another because they literally can't. And they can't overpower one another because they're both OP. So wh- no, no one's going to win. So, and you know this. The viewer knows this while watching. So it's just the most boring fight because you know no one is going to win this fight. And you're not even... Re- Have you ever seen a movie, Nick, where the hero and, the, and the, the main antagonist, the main protagonist are in a fist fight, and you're just like, I don't care who wins. Yeah. There's one other movie. 
What? Uh, uh, Man of Steel. Man of Steel. That's the other one. Yeah. You're just... It's a, Man of Steel. I think we, when we've talked about Man of Steel, we've talked about this as the yeah. same problem. They share the same problem. You just don't care. You're just like, how is this going to end? However it is, it won't be interesting. And also the in-fight scene kind of... Again, the inconsistencies. The inconsistencies with the, these last two movies. It throws away all of the heady, non-violent philosophy of what they've built it up to to just two guys punching the shit out of each other so it's just violence and it's not even like neo wins because he find you know he finds a new if you will oneness you know with himself or anything like that it's it's just two characters that are completely 100 percent completely evenly matched and they're just gonna keep punching each other and there's no way that, that like, because we we get the impression that Neo is better than Agent Smith in some way. Um, we don't know what it is, but we know it's not physically, because we know Agent Smith is matched with him, beat for beat physically. So why are we watching these two characters just beat the shit out of each other? You you just think that there were just yeah there would have been a smarter way for him to overcome this. And then somehow he dies. I can't remember how. I, I don't remember the anticlimactic ending. I know it was very, like, a, a very ham-fisted, like, Jesus allegory. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was extremely religious. Um, yeah. The theocracy in this movie is, is pretty... I, I don't know why they went this route either. And again, it's rolling the dice and just trying to figure out how to go with it. And I, and I get sort of, like, the, the Jesus aspect and going going that route with him because he's the one... You know, I mean that was set up from the beginning, right? Exactly. He was a but, very messianic figure. Yes, but trying to then figure out how you're going to go about it in a way in which it would carry out in a computer program should have been taken care of a little more delicately than what they did, and that's why they ended up at the end going, well, "What? How? Do, how wait, how does Neo just just beat Mr. Smith?" Like, it's like they never asked that question whenever they were making these sequels, yeah. and they instead posed a ton of other questions on top of that one. Um, which they also would never answer. Where, yeah, it just ends in a truce between the machines and the humans. Yeah, and then the ending to the movie is ex- is extremely symbolic, and it's really vague. Remember a lot of vague talking with no real closure whatsoever. Zero closure. Yeah, like, I'm... I A movie doesn't need to be, like, put with a bow... But here's the thing that people don't realize is that there still needs to be closure. You know what I mean? There has to be some sort of feeling of an end. And it doesn't feel like it's an end because it just feels like the Wachowskis wrote it so they could continue to make the story. I think it was one of those things where at the end of this movie, I say, what has changed? A lot of stuff happened, but what has changed? Yeah. And really, I don't know what that would have been in the Matrix because they weren't real clear about what they wanted to have changed in the in the entire universe. Is what there was no actual goal of anybody. No, I mean, no one, no one got what they wanted. The yeah. humans aren't free. The robots don't get their unlimited source of food. So, like, yeah, nothing. It's it, again, it was the setting of the stage in Reloaded where you're like the architect reveals everything you're like oh all of this doesn't matter and like at the time before we saw revolutions we're like well they'll hash this all out there's still a whole other movie they're gonna hash it out and then you watch revolutions you're like they didn't hash shit out nothing changed it's all for naught we just watched we just spent four hours watching something that has no conclusion no closure no nothing you should have been seeing what was the major event breakdown between humans and robots in a, you know, a very, very, very far beyond, you know, apocalyptic period, like super far into the future. And, and you should have been seeing like this moment that really changed everything. It's a, the movie's called Revolutions. You should have really been seeing what was the change in the guard. You know, back to human control, or th- there's no evidence really that that humans have taken back over. There's no evidence that the robots have that they're at. A, you know, and it's just like, and you there's, look at 
there's no feeling that the robots are going to keep this truce. Like, at the end, whenever the architect's talking to, I can't remember her name, um, you get the impression that it's like, oh, the robots are going to renege on that promise as soon as possible. Yeah. Like, you get no sense of, like, closure. And I wonder if, like, the the reason we Oracle. don't have any... Oracle, yeah. yeah. I think one of the reasons we don't have any more Matrix anything, and why this franchise could still be making money, actually, is that I think... I think the Wachowskis have a huge um, handle on um, the creative rights of it. The, the, they do. I, I, they own the IP, I think. So... They, I think that they're just at a point where, like, they don't see that there needs to be anything else done with it. No. Listening to them on the Nerdist, I kind of want to smack them. Um, especially Lana. Lana's really fucking obnoxious. She's just an obnoxious person. I think I've talked on this podcast on how fucking obnoxious I find Lana Wachowski. Uh, Lily doesn't really say anything. Yes, I looked it up. Her name okay. is Lily. Um... Lily doesn't really say anything. Lily I didn't know like, their I didn't know their names beforehand, so it's like Larry and I can't remember. The, yeah. I can't remember what Lana's uh, birth name is, but it's no. They just they've they've they have a very pretentious view of themselves. They have a very pretentious view of themselves and a very pretentious and condescending view of the audience. They seem very hostile towards the audience. So. Yeah, uh, it's it's not good. And I think that's the reason we don't have any more Matrix. Because they feel like everything's been said that needs to be said in it. You know? I feel like it's done. It's a it's closed book to them. And for the rest of us, we're like, no, no. There's this whole aspect that we could probably explore and try to, I don't know, make the story that we feel like we actually wanted to get out of the Matrix. Like Probably should explore. Mm-hmm. Because it, it feels like something's missing there. That being said, I love the Matrix, the, the first one, and if it's a standalone movie, uh, we, we'll all, we would have been scratching our heads why they never made sequels. Yeah. And mad that they never made sequels, but then, you know, you get what you want and... Be careful Kinda, it, what you wish for. Yeah, and you know what's interesting is a lot of people will say things like, uh, you know, and we talk about this on the podcast, is people saying, like, you ruined that one because of, uh, you know, like, this sequel ruins the first one, or, you know, a female Ghostbusters ruins their childhood, or whatever the hell. And it's just, like, super disconnected. You're like, no, that doesn't make any sense. But in some ways, Reloaded and Revolutions kind of retroactively ruins the Matrix because of what you know watching because of the information that those sequels provide about the matrix watching the first matrix and knowing that information is canon within it sort of devalues the first one yeah it and it might away. be one of the few franchises that does that it takes a lot away a lot of motivation mm -hmm. it takes away a lot of like suspense the inciting incidents then become questionable in the first yeah. one and uh yeah, all uh, like uh, the conflicts. You're kind of like, well, why are they fighting them if they know? You know what I mean? Like they know yeah. this. Then you know it's all this stuff that you just kind of sit there and you're just like, now this does, the first one doesn't make sense. It sort of deval like I said, it devalues the first one a little bit. So it's almost in this case better to ignore the first ones and literally bastardize them. Yeah, and just forget about them because the first one really is fantastic, and I don't think anything anything should be taken away from it. But it's hard not to knowing what was made afterwards. Agreed. But yeah, you should revisit it if you haven't, listeners. If you haven't, if you haven't watched The Matrix in a while, which I feel like the vast majority of our generation has not watched The Matrix in a while, I feel like we should revisit. I might revisit it tonight. Yeah, I mean, it's it is a movie that I feel like people should should go back and watch because shit, you you what a lot of our generation remembers is Reloaded and Revolutions being absolute dog shit because we got to go see those in theaters. Yeah. And many of us did not watch The Matrix in theaters, so we just lump it in there, and it's just like, ah, oh, because of The Matrix, we wind up with these two shitty movies. And it's like, no, yeah, I mean, that's true, but, you know, it, the, the Matrix was an awesome movie. It, it was still an awesome movie. Without those ones, it, if you forget that those ones exist, it's, uh, you know, it's probably one of the most revolutionary movies of, you know, of the 90s. Yeah. And definitely one of the most influential. For sure. 
Joe, I think it's time for the vault. The vault! Uh. Do you have a movie, Nick? Uh, yeah, I got a movie. You got a movie? Go ahead. Now? Yeah, yeah, I do, but you, I went first last time. That's fine. Hey, Joe, it's fine. As long as we're um, both prepared. And no one's throwing anybody under the bus here. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go with my string of movies that, uh, I have a specific point on why I'm recommending this movie. Uh, and the movie that I'm recommending is 2015's Gods of Egypt. Um, I'm specifically recommending this movie to show what white wa- the her- the the problems with whitewashing in this in our uh, in Hollywood. Now, whitewashing is something that I see from both points of view. I understand it from a producerial point of view that no studio is going to finance a movie. That has unknown uh, actors and actresses of color in it. I understand that. But, at the same time, when you make a movie called Gods of Egypt, and all of the gods, with the exception of two or three, are white, it kind of detracts from the movie. That being said, this movie should not have been a movie first. It should have been a comic book. It's actually a pretty solid fucking story. Um, I was actually surprised on how good of a story it is. Um, it plays like a comic book. It's written like a comic book. Well, it's not written like a comic book the same way that Batman v Superman is. But it's it's it, it has everything that you'd expect from a one shot graphic novel. Um, it, it it does have a really great story, and in spite despite of the fact that it's heavily whitewashed, there's a lot of great performances in it. Unfortunately, not from the protagonist. But uh, Nikolai Costas, if you're a Game of Thrones fan, uh, Jamie Lannister is fantastic as Horace. Um, Gerard Butler does his Gerard Butler thing, and he's interesting. Uh, he, he's, he's fine in it. He's fine in it. Um, Chadwick Boseman's great in it as well as one of the few black uh, gods of Egypt. Um, but the thing that I really enjoyed about this movie is that uh, the writers did their fucking homework. There's a lot of, like, solid Egyptian mythology woven in to this movie. Um, and woven in very effectively. Um, but that being said, you can't really ignore the fact that Horus is a white guy. A Dutch guy, to be specific. Uh, same thing with, um, not Anubis, I guess, Set. Set is also a white guy. Um, Ra is also a white guy played by Jeffrey Rush. You just, you can't really ignore these things. Like, it's just, it's a, it's a problem. It's it's a problem. Um, but I would recommend watching it for the story, if especially if you like Egyptian mythology. It's w- very well done that way. But again, it is a, it, the movie bombed because of the fact it's so heavily whitewashed. Um, so, it's, it's, it's an example of, I feel like Gods of Egypt is probably the beginning of the end. Um, you, you're already seeing it a lot with a lot of studios. Uh, they're not... They're trying not to whitewash things as much. They're trying. Granted, Hollywood's pretty slow on the uptake, but they're trying. So uh, that, that that's what I recommend for The Vault is uh, Gods of Egypt. Yeah, I think one of the problems with movies that are like that is, you know, they want to put stars in their movie to sell the movie, but Hollywood... We haven't produced any brown people in in Hollywood, or at least not enough of them. Yeah. As stars, as box office um, draws, and you know, and Hollywood uses that as their excuse for the whitewashing, but it's actually it's their fault. They didn't institutionalize yeah. this effort. You just, it's 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 all their fault. There's no Very one else to. Yeah. Snake eating the tail, sort of thing. Yeah. So it's one of those complicated matters where it's like. How would you expect us to make this movie, uh, you know, if we didn't have enough brown actors? Well, maybe you should have produced more brown actors and made more roles for them um, to create some stars so that people would go see those movies. That's what we talked about all last week when we were talking about Aladdin. Yeah, That's pretty the much. Reason why, reason why Genie probably should be – Genie needs to be a well-established actor. Uh, I texted Joe with another option, which I think a great uh, casting for Genie would be Eddie Izzard. I think he'd be pretty fantastic as that. Uh, you got that as a draw. But like like I said, like 
And like I said, Gerard Butler and Nikolai Kostas do a great job. They really do. They do a great job. But again, Horace should not be a white guy. He just shouldn't. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to do a movie that... Uh, um... Uh, I'm going to go into the 90s because I'm going to – I talked about how The Matrix was a movie that you, we had never seen before. I'm going to do a very, very – I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a movie that – to get as almost an example of the type of movie in the 90s that we were used to seeing at that time before The Matrix came out. And it's a, it's a very fun movie. It's a family movie. It's, a, it's just – it's predictable family comedy fun. 1997's Mouse Hunt. Oh, God, yeah. It's just fun. It's a. It's almost like farcical in its in its fun um, nature. But they use like an actual mouse. I think that they use an actual mouse and with a com- computer animated mouse like mixed in. But he's like they rarely use it because they didn't have a lot of the technology. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, and and this movie's very. Actually, I didn't know this. Nick, you know who directed this movie? No. Gore Verbinski. Oh yes, I did know that, but not. Okay, that, yeah, yeah. Now that I say it, it like hits you, and you're like, ah, oh, that makes sense. Like, it's that very much like adventurous camera work that is Live done in this movie. Cartoon. Yeah, pretty much, and um, it's it's just one of those like fun movies where um, Nathan Lane and um, Lee Evans are the the lead characters. So you are just saying those names, you know what you're getting. <laughs> if those are your leads, um, it's going to be very histrionic and comedy nature, but. Um, but in a good way because they're dealing with a mouse problem. Yeah. That is, um, you know, it's sort of like Home Alone sort of thing where, like, the mouse is causing them grief, but it's just a mouse. How do they get rid of this mouse? It's extremely predictable, but it's, like, heartwarming and things like that. But it's just a great exa- – it's one of those movies like, you'll watch it and you'll just be like, I'm not mad that I just spent time watching that. Nothing about this is bad. Like, it's a perfect encapsulated 90s movie. Like, yeah. nothing's wrong. Everything's fine. You don't have to worry about the ending. It's going to play out exactly the way you expect it to. But for a moment, you're going to think it won't. But then it will. <laughs> la da da Two years later, you'll see The Matrix and your head will, like, explode. So, 1997, Gorb Verbinski's Mouse Hunt. Awesome. Well, that wraps up another thrilling adventure of the Insert Movie Reference here podcast. Correct. Don't forget other podcasts on the network. Uh, Monday's Pavanus Warm Gun. Starting next week, Tuesdays, our new podcast, Toxic Volume. Wednesdays, the uh, Scenario Store News. Thursdays, the very podcast you're listening to. And Fridays, the original flagship, Sinister Dreamcast. And once a month on, month on a Saturday, on the Scenario Store News feed, Black Emporium News. So, uh, yeah, that's exciting. Joe, you got anything you'd like to add for our listeners? I do not. Well, if that's the case, Joe, what if I told you I'm Nick Kazina? Uh, uh, the blue pill? <laughs> what does this say? It's like a code to get into the nightclub, right? That means I'm Joe Kniff. <laughs> See you next week, and scene. See. You have been listening to the Sinister Dreamcast Network. For more from Sinister Dream Productions, check out www.sinisterdream.com.